For a pair of a topological space and a subspace, there are two relevant homology groups. The relative homology group and the absolute homology group if you collapse the subspace from the original space. And this video is meant to clarify what's the relation between the two. Like, are they always isomorphic or under what circumstances are they isomorphic? And to formulate the corresponding result, it's first of all necessary to introduce a slight variant of homology, namely reduced homology. And to talk about this, let's first of all fix, so fix a homology theory, call it H as usual. And homology theory means now homology theory in the sense of einberg steenrod so a homology theory with values in R modules. Okay, so given this homology theory, theory, we introduce this slight variant called reduced homology, which might have appeared already in the video about the homology of the spheres, but maybe only like internally without explicitly stating what it means. And the definition is very simple. Well, the reduced homology we um, denoted with a twiddle on top of the H of a topological space X, that's by definition, the kernel of the homomorphism that you obtain if you apply the homology functor Hn to the only existing map from the space X to a one-point space. Yeah, there's a unique map from the topological space X to the point, which maps every point to the point, and we take the kernel of the induced homomorphism in homology. Okay. So let's collect some properties, as we always do after introducing a new object. Whoops. So first things first, if I have a homomorphism in top, so a continuous map of topological spaces, then what do I get from this? Well, I always or definitely always get um, a commutative diagram of spaces if I just extend this homomorphism here to the one point space. Yeah, I mean, there's not much that can commute here and what can commute does commute. So um, this diagram is always available and now I can just apply my HN functor to this diagram. And if I do so, then I obtain the following. Here I got the nth homology group of X, here the induced homomorphism HN of F, then here HN of Y. And here we've got the homology of the point, Hn point. And here I've got the induced maps. And what do we see from this? Well, if we have an element here in the kernel of this map, yeah, so this is precisely what um, an element in reduced homology should be. That means, well, it's mapped to zero along this arrow here, but by commutative commutativity, it's mapped to zero along this composition, which means the element is mapped to an element of the kernel of this map. In other words, an element of the reduced homology of Y. So therefore, we obtain an induced homomorphism in reduced homology. And we therefore can call it H twiddle N of F, going from H N twiddle X to H N twiddle Y. Okay, so of course you know what I want to say here. This means reduced homology is a functor. From the category of topological spaces to the category of R modules. Okay, so strictly speaking what we um, thought about here is just that we, in, that we obtain an induced homomorphism. So the assertion that this actually gives a functor is the additional assertion that it respects compositions and that it maps the identity to the identity. But that is simply true because by construction, I mean, this homomorphism is a restriction of the original homomorphism. And well, since Hn is a functor, also Hn twiddle is then a functor.
What is the reduced homology of the point? Well, the map from the point to the point is the identity on the point. Hn is a functor, so you get the identity. Kernel of an identity homomorphism is always trivial. So in other words, no matter what this um, homology theory we started with was, we will always get that the reduced homology theory of the point is zero. And when I say zero, I really mean zero, no? So meaning it's zero for all n in z, including zero. And maybe this is conceptually um, an important point because the point is what's called the zero object in the category of pointed topological spaces. Yeah? Meaning that from every object in this category, you have precisely one arrow into the point and also the other way around. Yeah? From the point, you have a unique arrow into any other object, into any other pointed space because the base point needs to be preserved. And this is sort of convenient to know that this new functor H and Twiddle has the property that it sort of identifies the zero object as a zero object, yeah? so that it associates the value zero with it for all n. Yeah? This is not true for the original homology theory um, Hn in general, and um, this is maybe a conceptual good reason why one should consider this object. So let me just put this down quickly. So note that the point is the zero object. Yeah, that's both initial and terminal in the sense I just mentioned. So it's the zero object in the category of pointed topological spaces. And this has also a convenient consequence, namely if a map of continuous spaces is null homotopic, yeah, meaning homotopic to a constant map, then we can automatically conclude that the reduced homology of this map, the induced morphism, is the zero morphism. So this is an immediate consequence. Hence, if a map of topological spaces F is null homotopic, yeah, meaning homotopic to a constant map, then we can express this null, this well, being null homotopic by a commutative diagram, namely, if we consider this map F from X to Y, not in the topological category, but actually in the homotopy category, yeah, then being null homotopic means that this morphism factors over the zero object, factors over the point. Yeah, if it's homotopic to a point, then I can factor it through a point. And now if I apply the functor H and Twiddle to this diagram here, yeah, then um, I get a commutative diagram and this factorizes the homomorphism H and F twiddle over zero. In other words, this homomorphism must be zero itself. Yeah, so. So this, uh, I have a question. Maybe yes. Just to emphasize this, the reduced homology is not defined on top star, it's defined on top. Right? I, mean, I was wondering why you're stressing top star because we are looking at functors from top and not from top star. Yes. I mean, it's true what you've written, but. Yes. Well, I'm saying that, I mean, yeah. If you've worked with homology for a while, then actually the reduced, homo homolo reduced homology will often pop out in contexts where you're working with pointed spaces. Hmm. This is sort of what's behind here, but yeah, you're right. So it's not a functor directly defined on top star, but for this zero object in, in this category, category well, it has the value zero everywhere. Mm. Yeah. Now, let's say X is some non-empty topological space. Non-empty meaning that we can pick a base point in this space. Then using such a chosen base point, we can now clarify what the relation is between the reduced homology of X and um, the ordinary, or the unreduced homology of x and this comes from the observation that if we have this chosen point in x then the relevant map we're considering here namely the map from x to the point which sends everything to that point is a retract yeah a retract meaning i can just uh, take the inclusion of this point into x this provides me with a map in the reverse direction 
And this map has, of course, the property that if I um, map X naught here into the space and I retract back to X naught, then this is the identity on this one-pointed space. Yeah? This is the relation that says that this is a ret retract. And this has the effect that the short exact sequence coming from the pair of the space X and this one point, sub, one point subspace here splits into short exact sequences. So, and yeah, not only that, but moreover, these are um, split. So let's put down the situation. Let's draw the portion, the relevant portion of the pair sequence, H n X naught. H and X, and then the relative group, H and X, X naught. And this is customary to not put any parentheses here if it's a one point space, yeah? I mean, I mean the subspace consisting of this point. And um, right, going to here, then, well, I mean, yeah, first things first, since R is a retract and I possess such a retract, that means I have an induced map going into this direction such that this composition going from here and back here is the identity, yeah? That means in particular that this arrow here, um, sorry, that this arrow here is injective and that means that the previous arrow must be zero in the exact sequence, yeah? And therefore I can just put a zero object here. So this is how I got it here. And we already discussed the splitting lemma, yeah? If I have a, such a retract at the, as, giving me a section at, at this arrow, then I also obtain one at the other arrow, which has the effect that this um, map here is surjective, which says by exactness that this, the next arrow in the exact sequence is the zero arrow, so I can just put a zero here. So it's a short exact sequence and moreover it is split. Yeah? So thus the short exact sequence by, well, by the splitting lemma splits. So it's split exact. And this has several important <laughs> consequences in this context. So first of all, well, I've got the induced map from R here, so this one. This, let me just call it R star. By the splitting lemma, I get an induced split here, which I just draw as a dashed arrow. And the splitting lemma says even more. Well, it says that this middle term now can be identified with the direct sum of the two outer terms. Yeah, so H and X will be isomorphic to H and X naught plus H and X comma X naught. And the identification, the splitting lemma is such that these arrows are exactly the inclusion of the one sum in the direct sum in, in the direct sum. And this arrow will be under this identification, the projection to the other sum. In, yeah? And moreover, the same holds in the other way by our sections here. Yeah, so meaning this, re this arrow here will be the projection onto the direct summand, which is included here. And this arrow here will be the inclusion of the direct summand to which we project here. Yeah. <laughs> and this has the effect now that actually, um, yeah, the exact sequence is also exact in the other direction. If I put it, if I read it from here to here, and therefore the image of this arrow here which is injective, so it's just H and X comma X naught, equals the kernel of this arrow here, and the kernel, sorry, this arrow here, and the kernel of this arrow here, that is precisely by definition the reduced homology. So long story short, we have obtained from this, from the splitting, splitting lemma that the reduced homology of X is actually isomorphic to the unreduced homology of X relative to our chosen base point X naught. Okay, that's the first observation we get from here. And now, if we consider the um, direct sum decomposition which we get from this split exact sequence, then actually um, the middle term, so H n x, is isomorphic to the direct sum of the two outer terms. Um, and we just saw that the right term, the right outer term, that can be identified with the reduced homology, so that's H n twiddle x direct sum with the outer left term, so plus H n of X naught. And of course it doesn't matter if this point is called X naught or whatsoever, 
So it's just the homology of a one-point space. Yeah? OK. So this is now an isomorphism true for all n in z, meaning including z rho. Yeah. So the reduced or the, the unreduced homology differs from the reduced homology by the direct sum, and which is the homology of the point. OK, so far, we only use the first three einberg steenrod axioms to conclude um, these properties. Now, say also the fourth one is valid, the dimension ax axiom, which means if H star is an ordinary homology theory, Then we can specify what this um, difference by the one point here actually means. And we should do this once and for all so that we know what we have to think about. So if H star is ordinary, this shows that, um, well, at, this, at degree zero, the zero's unreduced homology of X is isomorphic to, well, just using this formula above here, the reduced zero's homology of X plus now the zeroth homology of a point, which by the dimension axiom is a non-zero module. Yeah? Though the dimension axiom does not specify which one it is, but it is one which we should not forget about. So we should put it here. Yeah? So it's H naught of a point. So this is the case in degree zero and in all the other degrees. So H and X. We use again this isomorphism. This is the reduced homology of X. But now the second term, this will be the, well, the nth homology of a point. But if n is not equal to zero, then the dimension axiom precisely says that this is zero. And therefore, we're done at this point. So actually, um, for n not equal to zero, reduced and unreduced homology are plainly the same, are isomorphic. Did you define ordinary? I wasn't paying attention for a second. Um, I hope so that we did define no. it when we listed the einberg steenrod axioms. No, we didn't? OK. No. So ordinary, ordinary means nothing else than it satisfies the dimension axiom. So, so let's put this in green then. <laughs> ah, the Y should also be green. <laughs> So, and I write here, satisfies the dimension axiom. Yeah, so a homology theory is called ordinary if it satisfies the, satisfies the dimension axiom, and it's called generalized if it doesn't. Okay, yeah, and it's, important to always keep track on which axioms you use so that you know that if the theory is valid for um, generalized homology theories as well or only for um, ordinary homology theories. Okay, so that was a long excursion on reduced homology. So it's this sort of says in the, well, homology theories with dimension axioms, which are the ones we're playing, we're well, basically interested in all the time in this course. There, there's only a difference in degree zero, yeah? And in all the other degrees, it's just, just the same. So now let me remind you what we were um, planning to do. So we want to clarify the situation between relative homology of a pair and the absolute homo homology of the space I obtain by collapsing a pair, uh, a subspace to a point. And this is formulated in the following um, proposition. And the assertion is that, well, we do not get an isomorphism between these two homology groups in general. We have to make an assumption on the pair we are considering. And the assumption is an old one. We need what's called a closed neighborhood deformation retract. Yeah? So that's a term we introduced last semester in German as um, absoluter, absoluter Umgebungsdeformationsretrakt. So new notion for this is CNDR, B A C N D R. So let me just write parentheses what it means. Closed neighborhood deformation retract.
So let's recall what it means. It means that the subspace A, first of all, is a closed subspace of X. And secondly, there exists a neighborhood U of A in X, which has the property that A is a strong deformation retract of that neighborhood. Okay? So, um, Hedger calls this a good pair, by the way, and, well, secretly, the more general term for such a thing is a co-fibration. But we don't want to discuss this right now. It's, it is what's, what's written here. Okay. So in this case, we consider the collapse map. Denoted by Q, which takes this pair X comma A and well, collapses the subspace, yeah? So I identify all points in A to one single point, X mod A, and of course then the relative part is just a point, yeah? So A has, has become a point in this collapsed space. A mod A is just one single point. And the, the assertion of the proposition is then the collapse map induces isomorphisms. And it does not quite induce isomorphisms in homology, then I wouldn't have had to do the whole excursion, but it induces isomorphisms if one um, reduces the homology of the collapsed space. So um, induces isomorphisms H star of the relative homology of the unreduced relative homology XA to, well, first of all, it does induce an isomorphism to this pointed one, so x mod a comma relative a point, but that is now isomorphic um, by what we said above to the reduced homology of x mod a. Yeah? Are you assuming that you have an ordinary homology theory now, or is this a general, um, general fact about homology theories? I think that's a general fact. That's Let's keep track on it in the proof that we don't use the dimension axiom, but as, uh, as far as I'm, I recall, we won't use it. So it's a general fact. Yeah, I think so too. Yes. Okay, so this is the isomorphism we need to prove. This isomorphism is already on the board, yeah? Because A mod A is now just a point, so it's homology relative to a point, which is the same as reduced homology. All right, let's enter the proof. So maybe let's leave the isomorphism visible here. So somehow we have to use our assumption that we're dealing with a closed neighborhood deformation retract. So let's use it right away and pick such a neighborhood, u and x of A. Well, which has the property that it deformation retracts onto A. So a neighborhood of A um, of which a is a strong deformation retract. And now I'm gonna um, cook up a commutative diagram from which we will see the isomorphism. So start with the group we're interested in, Hnx comma I, A. And here we've got our induced map, induced by this um, collapse map Q star, which goes to, first of all, this relative homology X mod A, A mod A. So this is just really the induced map by Q star. And well, we want to show that it's an isomorphism and what we will do is we will construct certain isomorphisms of these groups in the horizontal direction and in the end see that those are isomorphic. Yeah, that's the plan here. Okay, so the first one is an isomorphism going to H n x comma u. Yeah, so we've got our subspace A here, and you should think of this neighborhood u here as a thickening of the subspace A, yeah, because it does have the property that it deformation retracts back to A. So if we replace A by this, by this thickening here, we get the same um, homology group. And why is that true mathematically? <laughs> I mean, it should be intuitively, True, but why is it really true? 
And the argument one can use now is just to consider the triple sequence of the space X, the subspace U, and the subspace A of U. Yeah? So in this triple sequence, every third term will be zero because every third term is the relative homology group U comma A. Yeah? But since U deformation retracts onto A by homotopy invariance, first einberg steenrod axiom of H, I can replace actually H by A. So this is just the group H and A comma A, and this what we already saw is just zero. So that means in the triple sequence, the map of the two remaining pairs here is an isomorphism, yeah? So this comes out of the triple sequence. And actually the same argument works down here. So here we would then have H N X mod A, and here we take U mod A, yeah? So A mod A is just a point now, and U mod A is sort of a neighborhood of this point here, yeah? And um, since U deformation retracts on A, this means in the collapsed space that U deformation retracts on this point, A mod A, yeah? And then we have the same argument from the triple sequence, homology of point comma point is zero, and therefore the rest is isomorphisms, and therefore this is also an isomorphism. All right. Yeah, here you need uh, that it's really a strong deformation retract. Therefore, U mod A con, uh, ah, okay. yes. deforms to A mod A. Mm -hmm. To have this induced, right. So, that, so to make sure that the deformation retraction does induce one here, yeah, you need it to, be, to stay within A, this, yeah. yeah. To stay fixed know, on A, yeah. But do, do I need that it's pointwise fixed on A? Yeah, maybe, maybe I do. Or do I just need that points of A are not moved outside A? I, I feel more confident if it stays. Yeah. Fixed. So <laughs> then, yeah, let's put it. Let's put it like this. So if points in A are to totally fixed, then this is definitely um, true. Then definitely U mod A deformation retracts onto the point A mod A. Okay. So yeah. And also here, well, this collapse map Q is it's defined on all of X, so it also induces a map Q star here. Yeah. I mean, it has the property that it maps U to U. I mean, in this case, u to u mod a, so this induced map, I can also call it q star. Okay, so now what was the point of thickening the subspace a to this neighborhood u? So the good thing is now that I can apply, I can apply the excision isomorphism, because now the subspace a, which is closed already by definition, it's a closed neighbor deformation retract, has the property that its closure lies in the interior of u, yeah, because u is a neighborhood. So and contains an open neighborhood around A. So the closure of A lies in the interior of U, and if you remember, this is precisely the condition one needs to verify if, I'm one, if one wants to apply the excision isomorphism. And strictly speaking, this now goes into the other direction, right? Because the excision isomorphism is induced by the inclusion after taking out the subspace. So this is an isomorphism from X and now without A, yeah, so be careful. Backslash means you take the space out. Ordinary slash means you collapse the space, yeah. <laughs> so this is now X without A, U without A, and the same again works down here. So in this case, what I excise is the space point, yeah. So I ex excise the point A mod A from this space, and this also satisfies the um, condition on, in the excision axiom. So, oh, do I need something here? Do I need that points are closed? I want this point, I want the closure of this point to lie still of in A U mod, mod A. A. In U mod A? Yes. But actually I think, no, if. No, no, but the close. Oh. I think if I collapse a closed subspace, then the point I get from this closed it's subspace, closed, this yeah. will be closed. So this yeah. must, yeah. It's a little exercise in the quotient topology, yeah. But, yeah. Right, and A is closed by assumption. By assumption, yeah. yes, by assumption, yeah. Yeah, okay, so I have also satisfied the excision condition here, and therefore I can take it out. Uh, I don't have much space here, maybe I shall allow myself to <laughs> get some more, so this is x mod a, and I take out the point, I take out a mod a, 
and here it is u mod a and I take out the point again a mod a. Right. Okay. And now, finally, we're in good shape now because if we consider the pair of spaces, um, the two pairs of spaces that are written here, then what is it? Well, from x, I take out the subspace A. From the neighborhood, I take out the subspace A. What do I do down here? Well, I first of all collapse the subspace, but then I take out this one single point to which this, this subspace has collapsed. Yeah? And I do it here and here also. Yeah? So I've got this neighborhood where the subspace A is collapsed to a point. I take this point out. Yeah? But then I, I arrive at the same space. Yeah? So if I just take out the space or I identify that space to a point first and afterwards I take it out, it just gives me the same, the same space. So these are just the complements, the complement pair of the subspace A and therefore um, here the inclusion is actually already a homeomorphism of spaces and a homeomorphism of, or in this case even a homeomorphism of pairs. And a homomorphism of pairs, I don't need any axioms on the homology theory. I only need that it's a functor. So a homomorphism induces an isomorphism. So this induced map, um, yeah, which I still call Q star because it's just coming from this collapse map, restricting the collapse map. This is now really an isomorphism plainly because it comes from a homomorphism of spaces. All right. And then you can see that I am where I wanted to be. Yeah. So I have constructed a commutative diagram. I mean, these two squares are commutative. That means also the outer square is commutative. But now the outer square is just pure isomorphisms, a sequence of isomorphisms. And we can conclude that the first vertical map here is an isomorphism too. So this concludes the proof. All right, so let me scroll this back to normal. Now, since we know now um, that the collapse maps map induces isomorphisms, we can actually formulate a new version of the long exact sequence of a pair of topological spaces. And um, the virtue of this new version is that it's completely um, phrased in absolute homology. So no comma appearing. So we just take a pair of spaces, and not only a pair of spaces, but actually now it's got to be again uh, C and DR, obvi obviously, if we want to um, apply the proposition. And ah, this time I also have to require that it is a non empty C and DR. Yeah? I mean, so non empty C and DR means that A is non empty, right? I mean, well, the deformation we track is A, so A is the space that's non-empty and so also x is non-empty. Okay, so uh, non-empty, we'll see in the proof why we need it, but yeah, maybe that's a good point that we should discuss here. The previous proposition. Okay, so I wanted to explain what happens if A turns, happens to be the, the um, empty space. In this case, recall that x mod A is just x with a disjoint base point added, yeah? Because x mod A was defined as as this push out where you contract um, A to a point. So in, in this case, um, where A is the empty set, this just gives um, the, the co-product, just the disjoint union of X and, and an additional point. And in that case, the, the assertion remains true. Yeah, because I mean, yeah. So then we would have the absolute homology here. At this point, I don't see the cursor. Okay, it's all in the camera. So we see, um, the absolute homology of X here if A is empty. And here we see the reduced homology um, of X with um, an additional base point. And this should now be the same. Uh, is that right? I wanted to see it the other, in the other direction. Yeah, right. So X mod A, that's X with a disjoint base point added but we just saw above that the reduced homology um, is the same as the absolute homology relative to any point I can choose. So I now take this additional base point, and actually that's precisely what's written here, and what I get here is the space um, union, a separate base point relative this base point. But now I can use excision. Yeah? I can excise this additional base point because since it's 
completely disjoint and this um, excision condition is definitely verified. And then I can just, well, get rid of the point and what I'm stuck with or what I'm left with, I better said, is just the absolute homology of X. So it is still valid in this case. Actually, it's even valid if also X is empty. <laughs> still makes sense then, yeah? Because then H star of empty comma empty, that's just zero. And here we then get empty set mod empty set, which is just a point. And the reduced homology of a point, as we just discussed, is also zero. So it's not for the proposition that we require in this theorem that the CNDR is non-empty. It's for a different reason we'll see in a moment. Okay, so let X comma A be a non-empty CNDR, then we obtain well, then we have, my pen doesn't write anymore. Let's see. Let me try a different pen. <laughs> yeah. So then we have a long exact sequence. of reduced but absolute homology groups. So starting at the nth reduced homology of A, then going to the nth reduced homology of X, then going to the nth reduced homology of, and now not X comma A or something, we didn't even define this for reduced homology, but X mod A. And then it continues indefinitely. Yeah. So. So the nice thing is now that this is a statement just of about absolute homology. Yeah? So Lang long exact sequence of absolute homology. And how do we prove it? That's now very simple. So we have to use x comma a is non-empty. We use it in the first step. We pick a base point x naught in a. And then we derive it directly from the triple sequence that this is true. So and consider the triple sequence. consisting of the triple, the point x naught, the subspace A and the whole space X. Let's write it down. So HN A comma point is the smallest term going into HN X comma the point, is the middle term, and then the big pair HN X comma A. Then it continues. And now we see we can already identify everything the way we want. This is um, homology, unreduced homology relative to base points. So this is by what we discussed above, just reduced homology of A. For the same reason, this is the reduced homology of X. And now here we've got our proposition, which says that this unreduced relative homology is the same as the absolute reduced homology of the collapsed space. Yeah. And with these identifications, we get the long exact sequence as stated. So this is by the proposition. All right, let me end this video with an example application. Actually, an example we already saw, but which we can now recover. But won't do damage. So, to so by the way, yeah. I don't think we ever use the dimension x. No, I mean, yeah, good right. point, yes. And also, this is the way it was stated, yeah? So there was only this one point where I did assume the dimension x and the rest of the video was without dimension x. Yes. Okay, so one example where I want to apply this now is where our closed neighborhood deformation retract xA is just our favorite pair consisting of the k-dimensional disk and its boundary, the k minus first dimensional sphere. Okay, let's see what happens here. In this case, well, what does the um, long exact sequence have to say here? Well, in this case, we've got um, Sn minus one here, we've got Dn here, and we've got, um, oh, sorry, I should say K. So we've got Sk minus one here, Dk here, and here we've got Dk mod out Sk minus one, which is again, SK, which is the K sphere, yeah? But now the K disk is homotopy equivalent to a point and the reduced homology of a point is zero, as we already discussed. So that means again, every third term in this long exact sequence is trivial. So the remaining, um, I assume the remaining 
homomorphisms which do not end or start in the zero object are isomorphisms. And this has the consequence here that we obtain the nth homology of, um, and now I have to look from where to where does it go, it, the boundary homomorphisms are now the ones which are um, isomorphisms. So it goes from HNSK to HN minus one of SK minus one. Right? Okay. Now you use the, I mean, the way you explained it, you used the dimension X. Ah, okay. In this, yes, yes. In this example, yes. Mm. Good point. Yes. I should, then I should probably put it down here somewhere. Uh huh. So, yeah. Because I used, no, wait. Did I use it? No, 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 no. The, the statement that everything, that the point gets zero homology did not depend on the dimension axiom. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's I'm sorry. Can recollect it. No, you, you only use that the reduced homology of the disk is it's zero. zero. Yes. And that's true because it's the reduced well, homology of the point. Scrolling. Yes, this was just true because, well, if, if the map is a point here, then, well, so if the space X is a point, then this, the map from X to the point is just the identity on a point. So Absolutely right. The kernel of the identity homomorphism, that's I mean, I, I knew that the result is true in any homology theory. I just yeah. thought for a second you used in the argument no. the dimension X, but you so didn't. At this, at this point, no additional assumption. So this is actually for any homology theory, and we only assume the dimension axiom. Um, not even in this point. This was also still true without a dimension axiom, but here only for the statement that um, only in deg degree zero there's a difference. This is only a statement for a um, for an ordinary homology theory. All right. But yes, in a, at a later point. So maybe not here. So let's erase this arrow. But at a later point, I might still want to assume the dimension axiom. But for now, but well, I've got an isomorphism from H N S. Ah, sorry, you reduced. Need reduced. <laughs> you need reduced. This is now really important. <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise not true. And otherwise, oh, nothing would have been worth the trouble. Let's get back to black here. Sorry, definitely reduced. I mean, I'm, I'm following, concluding this from the long exact sequence from above for reduced homology. So I have this isomorphism if I shift here the degree and the dimension of this, the sphere by one. So now, of course, I can do this inductively. Yeah and do this um, k times in total so that I end up at the reduced homology in degree n minus k of the zero sphere. Right. Okay. And now maybe I want to ex assume oops, the dimension axiom to compute this. So say h is ordinary. In that case, I can now say what this is. Well, then I know this is just, um, what is it? It's, um, ah, it's no, I wanted zero. to assume it one step later. Crap. <laughs> nah, okay, so maybe I can copy it in a moment. So I'm still not assuming it. So the first thing I wanted to do, I have a space here which consists of two points and I've got a reduced homology here. So therefore I now um, wanna go back to ordinary um, to, not ordinary, <laughs> to unreduced homology. And I do this by considering the space with respect to one of the two points here. So let me just write here, well, S naught, that's just point, coproduct point. And I now consider this relative to one of the first two points. Yeah? So this mm -hmm. is sort of what I want to do is, for this I do not um, need um, the dimension axiom. And now I apply excision, for which I still don't need the excision, the, the dimension axiom. So I can now, since this is a disjoint union here, I can excise this additional base point here. So I get n h n minus k of a point, unreduced homology. And now I want to say that h is ordinary to compute this. So let's see. This works? No, it doesn't. <laughs> it, it would have, okay, let's, let, let me delete it. I mean, I, it, I didn't really believe that this would work. So, delete. Okay. So now I want to use the dimension axiom. So let's scroll this up a little. 
So this is now, let's use the dimension axiom here. And then I know what to do because the dimension axiom tells me that um, the homology of a point is zero whenever the degree is not zero. So I should distinguish two cases here. And maybe I'll draw it in blue actually. So when is the degree zero? Well, precisely if n equals k. Yeah, so this gives me, well, the zero's homology. I still don't know what it is. Yeah, this depends on the ordinary homology theory if n equals k, but I know I'm assuming the dimension axiom that in all other cases this is zero now. All right. All right. Okay. And well, this is the result we've obtained previously. Yeah. So um, the reduced homology of the sphere now is only has homology in degree the dimension of the sphere, and um, otherwise it doesn't. But previously we said do it exactly as in the case of the circle, as in the case of S1. Now we have a full proof. Yeah, okay. I didn't even remember that we <laughs> left a gap there. <laughs> and last remark, um, of course this also gives another interesting homology group. I can, I mean, well, I use this isomorphism up here. So this um, reduced homology by the proposition we proved is actually the same as the unreduced homology of um, dk relative s k minus one. Yeah, so the collapse map does by the proposition induces this isomorphism from here to here. But that means that also this interesting homology group of the k disk relative to its boundary um, has this homology computation. So it has one non-zero homology um, group in degree the dimension of the disk and all the remaining degrees have zero homology. 